partial differential equations in four and five dimensions can be used to give a new description of the Jones polynomial and the Kabbalah polynomial. Uh, as I actually mentioned on Tuesday, uh, my work was partly inspired by these authors, but I wanted to give the alternative to their approach to Kabbalah polynomial that was closer to the Gage theory ideas of the better established older approach to the Jones polynomial. So we're going to begin by describing the chasm parameters. So first we're going to remember the chern simons function of a gauge field in three dimensions and its relation to the Insulin equation in four dimensions. So in this talk, G is a complex simple Lie group and A is a connection on a G bundle, which I'm going to call E, over some manifold W. When we want to talk about the complexification of G, we call it G sub C. And a connection on a G sub C bundle we'll call curly M, which you can think of as a complexification of ordinary A. So curly A will be a complex connection on a G sub C bundle, such as the complexification of a G bundle. And we'll sometimes write U and U sub C for the spaces of connections on E or EC. And finally, Whenever I speak of an elliptic differential equation, we always mean that it's a, our equations will always be gauge invariant. So elliptic always means modular the action of the gauge group. So one thing you should know at the beginning is that if you have a connection that has a curvature tensor, and you can make all kinds of gauge invariant functions for integrating the curvature tensor, but in other dimensions, there also are these more subtle gauge invariant functions that are the chern Simon functions. But for the sort of thing we'll do today, three dimensions is the most interesting case. So in three dimensions, if we're given a gauge connection on a three manifold, that's crucial to W as a three manifold, then we can construct the churn sign in three form, and its integral is gauge invariant. Or more exactly, it's almost gauge invariant. It's really gauge invariant modular integer multiple of two pi. Those just one thing. Um, I'll give you 10 seconds to look at our cast of characters. And then getting into business, the form of three manifold, a connection has a churn Simon function, which I call CS today, which is the integral over a three manifold of the churn Simon three form. <coughs> now we're going to go from here the Insulin equation on a four manifold. To do that, we first take a Riemannian metric on our three manifold W, and then we place the obvious Riemannian metric on the space of connections. So we say that the L2 norm of a small displacement of the connection WK is just the integral of the obvious L2 sets <coughs> over the three manifold W. So this formula defines a metric on the space of connections. We also have a function on the space of connections, and then we take our function as a Morse function. So we have the Morse function and the metric, so we write the equation of radius times. So we introduce a variable S, which you can think of as a time coordinate. So the gradient flow equation lives on the three manifold times time. Our our three-dimensional connection will flow as a function of the force variable by this equation. So this is a differential equation in three plus one dimensions, which has a time derivative, but it also has spatial derivatives built in, because the definition of the chern simon function has a derivative in it, so the gradient of the chern simon function still has a derivative. So we've written a differential equation in four dimensions, but the construction had no reason to have four dimensions. However, something nice happens. The equation has four-dimensional symmetry, first of all, and it actually is equivalent to the Insulin equation on the form of called W times R. The Insulin equation, F is the curvature of our connection, and F plus, the plus is the self-dual projection in four dimensions. A two-form, such as the curvature, can be projected onto a self-dual or anti-self-dual feature, and F plus is the self-dual projection. 
So there is at least one equation that's been important in mathematics and physics since it was introduced in the 70s. It says that F equals to zero. And the fact that gradient flow of term function is equivalent to these equations is actually the starting point for four cohomology of three manifolds and its relation to Brahms and Hegel four manifolds. Since a lot of people have come in since I started, I won't keep going over the entire question. So just for very quick recap, we started with gauge theory with connection M and a G bond of three. And then in the case of three dimensions, a connection has a term time eigenvalue. You can always take a polynomial of the curvature of this gradient. But this is a more subtle and more interesting gauge invariant integral, actually gauge invariant mod two pi. And then we place the metrical in the space of connections. And having done so, we view the minus the term time function as a Morse function. And we wrote an equation of gradient flow on the infinite dimensional space of connections. So our connections were already in three dimensions. But when in writing, in writing the gradient flow equation, we introduced a fourth dimension, S, so that a three-dimensional connection is flowing as a function of the time coordinate, S. So now, really, we have a one-parameter boundary of three-dimensional connections, which you can think of as a connection on a four manifold, a connection on a G-manifold or a four manifold. But magically, but, so it's a four-dimensional equation, but it should have no reason to have any nice four-dimensional properties. Magically, it does. It's equivalent to the Eastman equation that you can be defined on any oriented four manifold and only uses the natural geometry of the four manifold, not the fact that this particular four manifold is five. And this is, has been an important fact in mathematics since four years ago, nearly 30 years ago, in developing this Hamiltonian counterpart of Donald and Hugh. Now, all of this was for a compact gauge group. But we want to do roughly the same thing for a complex gauge group, G sub C, for a complex G group, G sub C. And it's here that I would like to say something that's a little bit new. Everything is open choice. Essentially, we're in a review of the starting point of four of these. Are there any questions? Because I hear a lot of people asking dumb questions, and maybe some are more general. So first of all, remember now, gauge group is a complex G group, G sub C. So the bundle, G sub C, has structure group G sub C, so the connection is a sort of a complex value bundle, or more directly a Morse point, with values in the complex geometry. But it still has a turn Simon function. And the turn Simon function, well, it's still gauge invariant mod on the same concept. And roughly speaking, we want to do Morse theory using the term Simon function of a complex value connection. We have to make two immediate changes. First of all, a Morse function is supposed to be real, but the term Simon function of a complex value connection is a complex value. So we take the complex number of E to the I alpha of minus. Roughly speaking, we're going to make the real or imaginary part of the term Simon function. But actually, we'll take a more general linear combination of the real and imaginary part. We take the complex number of mod plus one, and we make the real part e to the i alpha times the term alpha. And that's an approximation to the Morse function of the loops. So I call it h zero. We'll improve it in a second. So the first modification we have to make is to go to a complex value, to make the real part, because of the fact that Morse functions are supposed to be real. But secondly, in doing Morse theory, we needed a metric on the space of connections. But there's no reasonable metric on the space of complex value connections that has the full complex gauge group. So we can take a metric, but it won't have the full complex gauge group. The best we can do is to take a camera metric that's only invariant under the compact subgroup of G sub C. So you see, if I took the trace of delta A wedge star delta A, it would be a bilinear form that would be complex value. Its real part wouldn't be 5 or 10. 
And it goes, so we could have something that would be just like a metric, except it wouldn't be positive definite. For Morse theory, you really want your metric to be positive definite. So we achieve positivity by taking delta A with a star of delta A bar, where the bar makes it positive. But the bar spoils the gauge invariant of the complex sleeper, leaving only invariant of the maximal complex sleeper. A slightly better way to say what I said is that first one picks a maximal complex sleeper, and then under that sleeper, there's a natural operation A going to A bar, which we use in writing this formula. Now that we have a metric and also a Morse function, we can write a gradient flow effect. But it doesn't quite do what we want. We're usually interested in the complex connection of the complex value gauge transformation. But here we first an explanation that the only invariant under unitary gauge transformations. In other words, we only care about the curly eddy of the GC value gauge transformation. But because of the renewed synergy of the metric, this equation only has the smaller group of gauge invariants, not the larger group. I'm afraid I can't keep reviewing back to the book. <laughs> so to compensate for the fact that our equation has reduced gauge symmetry, we have to introduce something called the moment map. And we should set the moment map to zero and consider the previous equation only in the space of zeros of the moment map. That will compensate us for the fact that we have reduced gauge symmetry. So in other words, having picked a reduction of the structure group from the complex sleeper to its maximal complex subgroup, given that reduction, we can replace the equation and express curly A as A plus I phi, where A is a real connection, and phi is a one form valued in the adjoint bundle of the complex sleeper. But informally, A and phi are just a real connection of phi with curly A. And now, you see, The metric that we picked would actually tailor it. And we have a group, then you see, acting as a group of symmetries of Taylor functions. So there's something called a moment map, which generates, there's a Taylor form because we have a Taylor metric. And when you have a group acting on a Taylor manifold, there's something called a moment map, which generates the action of the gauge group by how much time it flows. And in this case, the moment map is dA of star phi, where star is the Hodge star, which comes in because there was a star in the definition of the metric, and therefore also the Taylor form. So the moment map dA of star. And to compensate for the reduced gauge symmetry, we should consider the gradient flow equation in the space of zeros of the moment map. So if we do that, it almost has the right thing. We take the gradient flow equations that I've written down, and we consider them not as flows of the space of all connections, but only as flows of the space of connections of the moment map. But there's a better thing to do. It's slightly better, instead of by hand restricting to the zeros of the moment map, to add a Lagrange multiplier field, phi zero. So we take phi zero to be a section of the real adjoint bundle at E, and we extend the Morse function by taking the Morse function H0 of the next four and adding Lagrange multiplier times the moment map. What I've accomplished by doing this is that I no longer have to say by hand to only consider Morse flow in the space of zeros of the moment map. By extending the moment map, the Morse function, I've ensured that all critical points are zero. Because the equation, the condition for H to be critical with respect to phi zero is that U should be zero. Since H is linear in phi zero, the only phi zero dependent is written explicitly here. So the condition that the derivative of H with respect to phi zero is zero tells us that U is zero. So now we simply hope that on the space of phi zero, we'll be replacing the obvious metric, and having 
having done so, we simply consider gradient flow for this extended Morse code. So schematically, writing capital Y for the pair A and plus O, we write gradient flow for A. We introduce a time variable, and we write a D phi dS, which is minus the gradient of the Morse function. And that gives us some differential equations in four dimensions. They're in four dimensions because the Morse function was defined in three dimensions, but we now consider a one-parameter family of functions of pairs A and phi L. So a one-parameter family of three-dimensional functions is built up into four-dimensional functions. And these four-dimensional functions are supposed to date some DDEs. Something nice happens, just like what happens in the real case. The flow equations in this sense are elliptic partial differential equations that have a full four-dimensional symmetry. Both parts of that symmetry are supposed to be found in five ways. First of all, the four-dimensional symmetry means that although we introduced S, the fourth dimension, completely differently from the three dimensions we started with, nevertheless, they combine together to have a full four-dimensional symmetry. So that's supposed to be surprising. And the other part is also supposed to be surprising. A Morse flow for some kind of function or a field in d dimension will give an equation in d plus 1 dimensions, but normally it won't be an elliptic differential equation. It's a little bit of a miracle when that happens. So both things that have to are very nice. The equations can be written in manifestly four dimensional. What I've done, I don't plan a blackboard to write this one, but let's see if I can't stop. What I've, I'll go back in a second how I wrote these equations, but I've explained the key points here. In the way we built up the equations, we started with three dimensional fields. So in particular, phi is a three dimensional one form with values in the other function. But then we added a Lagrange multiplier phi zero, which was a section of the other function. Now, if M is the four manifold of the product W times R, then one form for M are one form for W plus a trivial real one form. So I can combine phi with phi zero to a field that takes values in one form for M tend to be add E. Add E is the bundle, the add one bundle of the of E. And I've done that in writing the equation in the way we'll get back to in a second. So we've combined phi and phi zero to a four-dimensional field that we'll just call phi. With that notation, the Morse three flow equations can be written this way in manifestly four-dimensional form. Where, remember, in defining the Morse function, there was an angle alpha. I refractorized alpha in terms of a real value of t. And then the Morse three equations can be written this way where the meaning of plus or minus is the following. For example, f minus phi wedge phi is a two-form, but we're in four dimensions. A two-form in four dimensions can be projected to its self full and anti self full parts. And those projections are denoted by the plus or minus superform. So these are elliptic equations defined by the action of the gate group for every t in or every mark. If t is zero or infinity, this way, writing the equations isn't good, and you should multiply one or the other equation by t or t equals. But anyway, there's a family of elliptic equations parameterized by the angle alpha for equivalent by t and r to one. And they're elliptic for all t or all r. I stress that because I expect the monotony of this family to be important, even though it hasn't been used yet. So the equations I've described can be used as a starting point for developing a floor-like theory for the complex screen group GC. If you were doing that, so you can start with these four-dimensional equations, which would be the analogs of the equations studied by Donaldson. And then using the floor, you can first look for time-dependent solutions. Well, if you think of the equations in terms of gradient trust, 
Then you see that the time is printed. In this form of writing the equation, it's obvious. The time independent solution are the critical points of the Morse function. The critical points of the Morse function have mu equals zero. And to make A not stationary, they are fast functions. So the time independent solutions would be the complex critical points. And then with a more core, you would study the flows of these critical and construct the analog of the four homology rings. What about suppose the rest of my lecture is about the complex case of the complex series? But I'm nevertheless going to make a digression for about one minute. Suppose you wanted to do four theory of SLTR or some other semi-simple real leaders. How might you proceed along these lines? Well, if t if t is zero or infinity, the equations have natural symmetry. The equations are not, are not neither odd nor even in time. But if t is 0, this term drops out. And this is even in time. And after multiplying by t, this would drop out. This is odd over here, 5 root minus 1. So if t is 0 or infinity, the equations have a symmetry of 5 root minus 1. If you simply ask for a solution that's invariant at the 5 root minus 1, you would say pi goes to zero, and you get back what was done by Donaldson and Flo. However, instead you can take an involution of the complex lead group G, and if you ask for invariance under this involution, combined with an involution of G, you get a reduced set of equations that you could use to construct a four-like series for any real form of G, not necessarily complex. So this is a fun thing you can do, but we won't do it. We'll go back to the complex case. Any questions for why I've said so far? Yes? How do the equations relate to the monopole equations to, to build it? To the monopole equations? Yeah. To the, which of you, first of all, don't we? So in three dimensions, maybe the six uh, The Bodo Mondi equations? No, the, the Sibyl Whitson equation. And the Sibyl Whitson flow conjugate with Kronheimer and Moscow. Well, in spirit, these, so the question is how these are related to cyber Whitson equations. In spirit, the Ethernaut equations, these equations, and the cyber Whitson equations are all conditions for supersymmetry in some supersymmetric H space. So in spirit, they're analogous. But in detail, well, they're qualitatively similar. With full high plane control monopole flow, they have roughly the same structure. Curvature, gravity. There is a precise simple relation. Although it's pure of the Any other questions? So actually, these equations were previously studied by Kaposin and Bing when we were working on gauge theory of geometric arguments. So um, the detail, again, this is just a digression. But um, roughly speaking, we considered a family of four-dimensional topological field theories that were just like Donaldson theories, except instead of the Ipsilon equations, they were based on these equations I just told you about. And we showed that geometric Langlois plurality is naturally formulated as an equivalent to these theories that arise in two different varieties of theory. <coughs> so from that vantage point, geometric Langlois plurality falls from what physicists call S plurality in any one form theory. Now, since we're not really going in this direction today, I've cut a lot of corners in these remarks. I've left out all kinds of details, one of which is that you really have to generalize the theory to complex values of t, which I'm not going to tell you how to do today. I'd really only explain PDs that are elliptic where t is real. So for real t, you can imitate Donaldson's more theory. And I won't tell you the generalization of PDs. Now, there is this four-dimensional, loosely speaking, a four-dimensional topological field theory. I don't believe it gives a thinking form out of what it does. And just like Donaldson theory, it may be a little bit less than a true topological field theory. Donaldson theory is clearly a topological field theory, but for four manifolds where these two properties are one or zero, the invariants you compute are not quite topological, are not quite true invariants. For example, 
Consulting and founder and chairman of Rocky Mountain. Very, very well known in Consulting Work and Mountain for many years. But in any case, in geometric line work realm, what you're interested in are not four mile contracts. Instead of four mile contracts, you're interested there in structures of the same top bottom of which they attach as two mile holes or three mile holes. Those structures being categories of ground dimension and spaces of physical space. And these structures are essentially not affected by the technical difficulties that crowd the spectral form on the basis. Now, although this theory probably doesn't get interested in four non-fold effects, although I still think it's <coughs> short, the literature does give a reason to believe, at least in my head, maybe even in four folks, that it gets interested in non And that's because there's a generalization of geometric line lengths that people in that field call quantum geometric line lengths, which is related to quantum physics, but it's also related to the Jones formula and similarity of various atomics. So maybe this should make us suspect that those four that the T to the top bottom of slope grade associated with those four dimensional grades would be related to the Jones formula. I'm not sure if it should have made us think up that maybe. And I also should mention that there's another clue which actually is more influential to me just because I participate, which is that Claudius and Hamilton described Kabana homology in terms of ingredients that appear in geometric line lengths. So that, at least for me, that was a more useful thing, telling us to try to understand Kabbalah homology using the same ingredients that were relevant to geometric lines. Anyway, think, so, so today I'm going to tell you what the answer turned out to be. And by the way, I should say that there's a written version that there's a write-up that corresponds fairly closely to today's talk, which is on the web. You'll find it on the map like that. And as I explained in the first page of the written version, in both that write-up and also in today's talk, I'm only explaining how to explain what I claim is true, rather than where I got, claim to have gotten from in terms of quantum theory. So, just in terms of the what statement is true, the picture that we arrived at is like so. So we take our four manifolds to be W times R plus. W is a three manifold r plus is a half line, which I'll parameterize by a variable r. So r plus is a half line where y is not negative. And importantly, it's a closed half line, so it includes boundary of y plus y. So we're going to consider those four-dimensional equations on this half space. But it's crucial to tell you what's what's happening, both at y and infinity, and at y equals zero. At y equals infinity, we require the fields to approach a chosen critical point of the Morse function. So I told you what the critical points are. They're complex flat dimensions, basically. So essentially, the critical points are representations of the fundamental group in the complexification of the gauge group. But the simplest case is that W is just S3 or R3. So a complex flat connection is gauge equivalent to a trivial connection, and there's only one possible critical point, A implies zero of the gauge map. So if we're actually trying to do Kabana homology, which is only defined in the case of R3, then the boundary condition at infinity is just that everything is zero. But we could generalize to a more general three manifold, and then the boundary condition would involve picking the complex flat connection. Instead, the map K lives at y equals zero, that is at the endpoint of R plus. So the picture is shown here, where W, which I've drawn as if it's a sphere of X, times R plus. There's a simple boundary condition at infinity. So if W is a sphere, then the boundary condition at infinity is that everything is zero. But there's a much more subtle boundary condition at y equals zero. And the boundary condition depends on the choice of a knot K. So 
We study the four dimensional equations I've told you about with zero boundary conditions of affinity, but with a rather sophisticated boundary condition of the origin. And that rather sophisticated boundary condition depends on K. So although it's a rather sophisticated boundary condition, it is elliptic. So with this boundary condition, it makes sense to talk about counting solutions. So for the moment, I'll proceed without telling you anything about the boundary condition of line being null. And uh, just using the fact that it's elliptic so that we can sensibly talk about counting solutions. But as I have already stressed, the boundary condition does depend on the non k. And it also depends on the choice of a representation R of the dual group, g check of g. The dual group is the dual in the sense of line points on the of the guiding points in R. In this description, the only way that either the knot or the representation fits is that the boundary condition depends on that dual. Our next step, we just imitate Donaldson here. We count the number of solutions of our equation with this known number n. So, more of a non compact form manifold. So, in small number, it's a topological invariant, essentially the second chart test. It's integrated on a compact form manifold without boundary. Here, there's some subtlety of both infinity and of the origin. But to oversimplify it, the boundary conditions at both ends give trivializations of the bundle mean. And since the bundle is trivialized at both ends, we can make sense of the instant run number as an integer value of topological invariant. So with these boundary conditions, fixing the instant run number, the n, you let a n be the number of solutions of the equation. We're just as in Donaldson theory. The number is meant in a slightly subtle sense. Each equation is weighted by a sign, which for physicists is the sign or the determinant of the Dirac operator obtained and linearized around a given solution. You make a count of solutions weighted by appropriate sign, and that count gives an integer a n, which in general means a positive infinity. It's an algebraic count of the number of solutions. Conjecturally, there are no solutions in this Having counted the number of solutions, you, you uh, introduce a formal variable q and define the corresponding Laurent series. Well, it's a Laurent polynomial given the con conjecture that a n vanishes once initially large n. And then I claim that if the dual group is SU2 and R is a two-dimensional representation, this will be the Jones polynomial. And in general, I claim that the series will give you the usual knot variants associated with quantum groups and chain finite stage two. Any questions before I just pause it? Ah, okay, it's fun to have a new way to describe the Jones polynomial. But for today, our goal is Kozanov homology, not just the Jones polynomial. And There's a baby version of that conversion that's implicit in my group. We proved that on a compact form manifold without boundary, a n is zero unless n equals nil. So when there is a boundary, I want that to be violated, but only by a finite event. Any other questions? So to get the Kalama homology to a knot, we're supposed to associate not a number 
or more exactly, a function of the variety of kin, but a vector space. Which will more than be z greater space that you can think of as the homology of some chain complex. A suitable trace in the vector space will give back a number. So, or the function of kin. So, in plain words, what categorification means is that the picture has to be derived from a picture of one more dimension. So here's an explanation from physicists. There's going to be an extra dimension that we haven't introduced yet. So I already introduced an extra dimension because we started with a three dimension and worked our way up to four. But that fourth dimension is now just one of the dimensions we know about. We're going to introduce a new dimension, which will be a fifth dimension. And that's going to be the time dimension in explaining the bottom of the model. So viewing the fifth dimension as time, quantization will give me open space, which will be the Kamala model. And then if we compact it by the extra dimension of the circle, we'll get a trace leading back to the original theory. So, from our point of view today, categorification doesn't mean you introduce a lot of algebraic machinery. It means that you introduce a new dimension. Which, by the way, the first time I heard about the idea of categorification was from Igor Frankel around 1990. And that certainly was his picture. The categorification was supposed to mean that there was a fourth dimension. That was thinking of the jump monomial as a three-dimensional group. Now, I've reformulated the jump monomial as a four-dimensional group, so the new dimension will be a fifth one. But the idea is the same. Categorification doesn't mean you talk about categories of a lot of algebraic machinery. It just means that there's another dimension in the problem that you didn't know about before. So we're going to practice by categorifying something. And we're, I will get now to explain something that's standard for applications of gauge theory to three and four dimensional manifolds. And it actually will be a reformulation of what I started with at the beginning, where we related the term sign function gradient flow to a gauge manifold. But we're just going <coughs> to without explicitly connecting with the previous discussion. The Kazan invariant an invariant of a three manifold that's defined by counting the five connections on a G bundle. If you pick a topological type of G bundle B, you'll know this. And then on G, that you consider a space of all connections. Within the space of all connections, there are some orbits of five connections. And roughly speaking, you count the five connections. You count the orbits of five connections. But you do an algebraic count of the electric by signs. So this counts the number of connections. So what is a five connection? Well, a five connection obeys an equation. The equation says that it has to be zero. It's a perfectly good equation, but it's not an elliptic equation. Instead, it's part of a nonlinear elliptic complex. The reason is with two dimensions, this equation would be elliptic and not the gauge group. But in three dimensions, there's a geometry identity that says that a certain linear combination of derivatives of the curvature so because the curvature obeys the geometry identity, the vanishing of the curvature does not elliptic except in two dimensions, where the geometry identity is absent. Now, nonlinear elliptic complexes are fine, but just as for a linear one, it's sometimes convenient to fold the complex and reduce to the case of an ordinary elliptic equation rather than a complex. For instance, a classical case is if you've got the G bar operator with a complex manifold acting from zero to one to zero to one one points. Well, you could combine together all the forms of E to the power of three and adding the G bar operator to that one, reduce to the case of a single elliptic operator rather than an elliptic complex. Sometimes that's useful. In the present example, the analog <coughs> is to introduce a field phi zero, a section of the atom bundle, and to replace this equation with the Borg Long equation. The Borg Long equation says the curvature is not zero, but it's zero plus the Hodge star acting on the derivative of the phi zero. 
they're trying to apply to the one form, and three of them star that one form to two forms. So this is a relational two form. This is actually an elliptic equation. So if we study this equation, we're in the world of elliptic equations rather than elliptic complexes. However, the count of solutions is the same. Because the simple action theorem says that for a smooth solution on a complex manifold, five molecules will be vanished. But now the equation is elliptic. So from some points of view, if you're studying the Cassini variant, it's better to start with this equation instead of this one. One example of why it might be better is you might want to categorify the Cassini variant, which means that a number, the Cassini variant, should be the Euler characteristic of the vector space. So to us, categorification means introducing a new dimension. And we do it by replacing phi zero by the covariant derivative with respect to the new coordinate. So we replace phi zero by d by dx. So we replace the three manifold W by the four manifold W times R, where R is parameterized by the time S, and we replace phi zero by D by S. Now, the reason this makes sense, what's the minimum of chaos one for that makes sense? Generically, if you replace phi zero by D by S, you'll turn your differential equation into a differential operator. But in this particular equation, phi zero only appears inside its covariant derivative which is a commutator of the exterior derivative with phi zero regarded as a multiplication operator or differential operator with degree zero. So if I replace phi zero by d by ds, this commutator is still a commutator which now becomes a component of the four-dimensional curvature. So replacing phi zero by d by ds still gives us a differential <coughs> operation rather than a differential operator. So that's good. But generically, it would still be, in some sense, a beta equation. In other words, it wouldn't be elliptic or parabolic or anything else that ever gets here. So usually, even if you get a differential equation for a procedure like this, you won't get a nice one. It won't be elliptic and it won't have four-dimensional symmetry. In this case, however, we actually get back to the Ethernet equation, f1 equals 0, in a way that's really only slightly different from the way we got it at the beginning of the lecture by the gradient problem. So what follows from this is that the Cassini variant, which is a numerical variant computed by counting solutions, can be categorified in fuller cohomology, in which a more subtle variant, the vector space, is constructed starting from a chain complex that has a basis corresponding to the same solutions. You see, Cassin said, you start with the solution of x equals 0, and then you weight it by a suitable sign, 1 or minus 1, and then you count them. Instead, Moore said, you start with the solution of x equals 0, and then you associate it with a basis vector for a chain complex, and then you work hard to find a differential in the chain complex, and you define the four homology. But if all you wanted to know was the Euler characteristic of the chain of the homology, you wouldn't know you'd know the differential. To get the Euler characteristic, you would just count the basis vectors weighted by sign. And that would give back what Cassin did. So Cassin did a count of these solutions weighted by sign. And that was fine, and it gave an integer diagonal variant. But Floor categorified it using the fact that the first, well, in my presentation, it's slightly different, it's probably from what Floor did. You replace the count of these things by the count of these things, and then you categorify by replacing this equation by a four dimensional equation. And that tells you that the objects that Cassin were counting can be, instead of just counting them, they can be turned into basis vectors in some chain complex. So you end up with a homology group whose Euler characteristic gives back Cassin's count. So you don't need to know anything about categories and morphisms or hierarchical. Categorification just means that you take the bulk of all the equations 
and I need to replace you. You can introduce a new variable by replacing phi zero with a P by S, and that gives you a good four-dimensional equation, an elliptic one. That's why the casting variable can be calculated. So now we want to for the Jones form for the Jones form model. But maybe I'll get to that and ask a very question. So from the point of view of the Poisson lecture, the Jones polynomial is the invariant associated with counting solutions of these equations with certain known conditions. Now, on a generic form on called M, we had no way to consider it because there's no candidate for P with phi zero that could be replaced by P by S. Categorifying would mean taking a scalar field out of the fields of here and here, and replacing it by d by x, where s will be a fifth coordinate. But the fields that appear here are a gauge field and also a one form, so generically we don't know what would be mean by phi zero. However, let's specialize to the case that our form on the is w times r plus, which anyway is the case relevant to the Jones form. Then we have the decomposition that we actually did in the first part of the lecture with one forms on M or one forms on W plus one forms on R plus. And the part of phi that is the projection in the second sub M is the field of phi zero that we originally introduced as a Lagrange multiplier. So we categorify by introducing a new dimension and replacing phi zero by D by S. Again, phi zero only appears in both commutators. The converted derivative is a commutator of phi zero with the inferior derivative. And although it's compressed, it's a standard compressed notation, but the wave product of echoing value in one forms is understood to include a commutator in the other. So since phi zero only appears inside the commutators, when we replace phi zero by d by s, we still have a system of differential equations. So we get a system of partial differential equations on the five manifold X, which is R on the four manifold W times R plus. And the same magic that I keep telling you about happens in a slightly restricted form. What we get this way is a system of elliptic differential equations in five dimensions. And moreover, if we set T equals one, we get back four dimensional symmetry, meaning that the five dimensional equations can be naturally formulated on M star times R plus for any four manifold M star. So we've lost the symmetry that involved the R plus projection when we replace phi zero by D by S. But magically, we got a new four dimensional symmetry involving the R or S projection. Is there anything I can clarify about this? Now, I haven't yet explained the four-dimensional boundary condition that you have to use to get the Jones polynomial, but it can be lifted to five dimensions, roughly by replacing phi zero by d by s. Of course, we're now on five manifold m star times r plus. The boundary is a four manifold m star rather than a three manifold w. And instead of modifying the boundary condition on the not k and w, we modify it along a two manifold sigma and m star, as in the next picture. So we're now on the product of a four manifold times r plus, and in the boundary, m star times the endpoint of r plus, we have an embedded two manifold sigma. There's a subtle boundary condition at the boundary of the neckline, and that boundary condition is more of a modifier on sigma. Now, to get the candidate for Kabbalah homology, we specialize to the time independent case 
which was the first place that appeared in our generation. The M score is R times W of sigma of R times K. And then following four, we define a chain complex <coughs> that has a basis given by the climate and the solutions. Well, the way I got the five dimensional equations guarantees that the climate and the solutions are the solutions of the four dimensional equations. Cutting the small points, but basically, we started with four dimensional equations. We made them time dependent by adding an S dimension, but if we forget the S dimension, we, we just get back where we started with. So, if we count the, the, these solutions, we get the Jones polynomial, which in today's lecture is the analog of the Casimir theorem. But if instead of simply counting those solutions, we think of them as time independent solutions in five dimensions, then we can imitate the flood and define a chain complex in which there's a basis corresponding to the U solution. And in that, in that space, we construct a certain differential, like counting five-dimensional solutions. So we define a chain complex that has a basis given by the U solution. So we have to imitate four to find the differential in the chain complex. But if all we want is the Euler factor, of the homology theory that we're going to get. We don't need to know the differential. So the Euler characteristic will then lead us back to counting the solutions of these equations, which will give us back the Jones polynomial. We get the categorification of the Jones polynomial, which is our candidate for four homology. We imitate four, and we define a chain complex which has the time-dependent solutions for basis, and the differential is constructed by imitating four in a standard fashion counting certain five-dimensional equations. Here I have to do with the fact that the gradient flow of the original, the five-dimensional equations, which I didn't even write down here, can themselves be interpreted in terms of gradient flow in the fifth dimension. Once you know that, you can imitate everything for and get the disappearance. Then the cohomology of this differential is the candidate for cohomology. candidate for modern homology is z times z graded, like the real thing, where one graded is the cohomological grading that you get in four and three. Or it's the cohomological grading that you get in four like this, where you construct a chain complex based on the critical points. The second grading, sometimes called the Q grading, is a use homology. It's graded over all four manifolds, so I'll be talking about plus. As I said before, because of the non-contraction in this situation, the definition of the Q gradient has two qualities. And when you work it up carefully, these subtleties match what's known in terms of language theory. So in the time-independent case, we can get the Carvana homology, but we're not limited to the time-independent case. For a more general signal, we can get candidate for the non-component, the Carvana homology. Here I've chosen sigma to consist of First of all, what I loosely call a knot could be a link instead of a knot. So um, I've chosen a sigma to consist of a single unknot in A and a pair of unknots in the future. And then I pick a particular sigma for the pair points between this one and this one. And then a suitable count of five dimensional solutions with this type of boundary condition in the past and this other type in the future will give us a candidate for the morphism of Kavanaugh homology. So, in a slightly abstract sense, I told you what the picture is supposed to be. In three and four dimensions, there's four and Donaldson, which is based on five connections or histonomes. And what may have been confusing in the lecture is that we imitated it twice. <coughs> Once in building up the picture related to the Jones polynomial, and then more importantly in going to five dimensions. So the three and four dimensional picture we imitated it to more in five dimensions to get a categorification of the Jones polynomial. So I told you the strategy, but we, there's a very crucial ingredient in this story, which are the boundary conditions. And 
I actually believe that the theory I'm talking about tonight, um, unlike a lot of funny things that physicists talk about based on quantum theory, it should be possible to make this theory rigorous. And the main problem that mathematicians will face is that there will be a potential barrier to becoming convinced that the building has to be prepared seriously with boundary conditions. And because the boundary conditions are Aristotle, I'm not going to completely explain them today. Now, first of all, it's essentially enough to describe the boundary conditions in four dimensions. All the subtleties appear in four dimensions, and one term says the boundary conditions there will end in five dimensions and fairly obvious. Moreover, the boundary condition is local. So initially we can assume that the boundary of our four manifold is R3 with, with its Euclidean method. So we'll just work on the X place, R3 times R plus. Anyway, that's about the case with the right case with the Jones polynomial. Except that to get the Jones polynomial, we have to modify the boundary condition a long time. Now I need to tell you about one of the important equations in Gage theory, which is Nam's equation. Nam's equation is a system of ordinary differential equations for a triple of three elements, a triple value in the product of three copies of three algebra of G. The equations read like so, together with cyclic permutations of x1, x2, and x3. <coughs> On a half line, y greater than 0, non equations have this special solution. The solution is singular if y equals 0, so we'll, this should be an open half line. Where the gi are three elements of the Lie algebra that obey the S2 combination relations. So for, for any homomorphism of the Lie algebra of S2 to that of G, there's a special solution of non equations which was important in Nam's original work. He introduced these equations around 30 years ago to describe what are called monopoles, solutions of the bulk of all these things. Okay. We use these equations a little longer. So Nam was studying the solutions of these equations in R3, and he showed that the analog of the ABHN transform mapped them to Nam's equation. That was an advance because he was in one dimension instead of three, so it's advanced in computation. And moreover, he showed that this type of singular solution of non equations was important in studying monopoles. And it's been important ever since in applications of non equations. In this kind of singular solution, the T's are associated to any S2 subalgebra of G, but we're interested in the case of a principal S2 subalgebra. So what we're going to do with this type of singular solution of non equations is to define an elliptic boundary condition for our equations. So in fact, non equations can be embedded as a special case of our four dimensional equations. We look for a solution in four dimensions that's invariant under translation to R3, the connection vanishes, and moreover, the component in the y direction of phi is zero. So phi is built out of three elements of the algebra, the phi's. Then our four-dimensional equation reduced to non equations. This one with the cyclic combination. So the non pole gives a special solution of our equations. We define an elliptic boundary condition by declaring that we will only allow solutions that are asymptotic in this one for y greater than zero. So if you think of what boundary conditions are supposed to mean Dirichlet or Riemann or a simple modification, then this isn't in that world. On the other hand, if you think that an elliptic boundary condition means that you pick a middle dimensional subspace with the property, well, let's say coiled, for a nonlinear elliptic equation, an elliptic boundary condition is, well, induces on the linear addition an elliptic boundary condition on the linear algebra. So we have to discuss what's meant by an elliptic boundary condition on a linear elliptic algebra. And the general idea is that you're supposed to consider a middle dimensional space of solutions whose intersection, which intersects transversely with the solution of vanish and I T boundary. 
So in that poor abstract sense of what's meant by electric ground information, this is one. It's not a simple Dirichlet in our mind, but it's an electric ground information. And the general theory of electric ground information applies to this type of ground information. So that's the ground definition that we want to blind to serve in the absence of noise. And as I've already told you, for the most obvious ground definition, we're getting covalent homology. We just say that things are zero at the blind end of the So a special case of what should be proved is that these conditions on the half space are free on both of us. The special solution with the knob hole is even more. In other words, if you're on R3 times R plus, there's one solution that you borrow from time. And in the absence of knots, I'd like you to believe that the only solution with these ground definitions and no knots is the one borrowed from knots. That would correspond to Kabbalah homology of the empty knot in your brain one. So I should um, go and tell you what are the ground definitions in the presence of knots. It's actually a little bit too tricky to properly explain that. So I'll take a couple liberties here. Um, we'll get back to it partly in a second. But one thing I would say is that in the recent paper with Rialto, we've made considerable progress toward doing what I'm not doing from the one theory, which is to prove directly, not by invoking the original arguments of quantum history, that the counting of four dimensional solutions is its own quantum theory. And therefore, the five dimensional solution is a categorification of the drone quantum level. So it hasn't been investigated in the future. So I want to give you a couple hints of what Ryoko and I did. And that, in the same process, I'll give you a few hints about what the boundary conditions look like here or not. So, uh, so uh, I'm probably running out of time, but anyway, I'll also hear you. One thing to remember is that standard approaches to the Jones quantum world, covalent homology, often begin by considering the projection of a knot in two dimensions. So wherever we draw a knot, like that one, which must have been layered in two scale, in the two dimension, uh, we usually draw it using the projection in two dimensions. And what Jones did, for example, was given a knot projection and also a covalent. They take a non-projection and give them a non-projection. They give them an algebraic recipe for constructing some something, which in Jones's case was a function, and in Kovalev's case was a homology group. And then you have to prove that what you get is independent of the projection that you take. Now, in today's lecture, with the opposite of projection, because of the three, four, and five-dimensional symmetry of all the equations we discussed, invariance is obvious. But you might ask how to incorporate a knot projection. If you're going to make contact with one of the standard descriptions, the standard descriptions always involve a knot projection or something very much like it. So we'd like to know how to incorporate the knot projection in the description of the Jones quantum level that I gave you. So in what my other and I did was that instead of requiring that everything vanishes as y goes to infinity, we kept the condition of k, but we changed the condition. We take a triple of commuting elements of the Lie algebra of the maximal torus of G, and we ask for phi to approach a specified function of that standard. So we use the fact that the equations have an exact solution where A is zero and there's no knot, and phi has this form. That exact solution is actually part of the theory developed by now, the counting of solutions of an electric equation is constant under continuous variations under rather low conditions. So, in respect of the Jones quantum angle, can be computed with this more general asymptotic condition. If g is SU2, then the maximum torus is one dimensional. So, a non zero triple is just a vector in space times a fixed element of the Lie algebra. Taking a vector in space means you take a direction which you're going to project the knot. 
So the choice of A determines the projection of all three equal planes. So this is now built into the construction. So we have something which is manifestly invariant if phi goes to zero infinity. But instead, if we perturb the boundary to infinity, the phi goes to the non-zero triple, then we build in a, a, a non-projection. So taking C to be non-zero is described by this is this a uh, gauge symmetry breaking or moving on the Coulomb branch. So such operations appear in many branches of physics as well as math. Taking C to be sufficiently generic, which for SU2 is just means it's non-zero, gives a drastic simplification because the equations become quasi-abelian in a certain sense. If you like, this is the analog of the Feynman and Donaldson equations. Gibbs non equations with the side of the equations, which are kind of quite ideal. Taking C is especially generic. That was one of the strategies by SMRD. And the equations became quite ideal, so we were able to reduce this manifestly invariant description of the Gibbs polynomial to a non polynomial. So there isn't much time to explain it. Imagine without it's better you know, to go with the but you it was complex, but you can see it better. You scale up the mountain so it becomes very big compared to one over C. And then the quasar is very description of all of that more valid. And you eventually reduce the counting of solutions to something manageable. So uh, here's the really kind of to go into detail, but I just want to spend another moment or two on the topology of the fact that I think I've used up my time already. I should ask the uh, chair how much time is left for, because I believe the answer is negative. I won't, I'll just go on for two or three minutes. So, so but, but at least I'm going to give you a hint of how the boundary condition is modified along the line. So the local model is that the boundary is R3. And any knot locally looks like a copy of R linearly embedded in R3. Now, we define the boundary condition away from knot by giving a singular model solution and saying we only allow solutions that look like that when you're near the boundary. We do the same thing again near the knot. So we look for a singular model solution that has the non pole away from K but has some other behavior of R K. The model solution is invariant on the translation of RK, so it can be obtained by solving some reduced equation in three dimensions. So there's a three dimensional picture that looks like this. There's R2 times R plus, and the knot just pierces R2 in one point. If we add it back to the third dimension of the boundary, that point would become a line, which would be R1. And now my claim is that if you specialize the equations I've told you about to three dimensions, then we have a unique solution for every representation of the Gould group. We have a unique solution that away from, on the boundary away from K has a non pole, and near K is non pole is modified in a way that depends on the choice of the representation of the Gould group. And this modification is related to the uh, Hecke modifications of. Geometric lines. So I told you before that the use of Caldas, by Caldas and Kepnikus of Hecke modifications to describe geometric line work has been a clue. And the more I use it concretely is that for every representation of the Gould group, I find a special solution that, in a certain sense, is related to a Hecke modification of a type determined by a representation of the Gould group. And then that's used to give the boundary condition the Since the time left is negative, I'll resist the temptation to tell you a little bit more and stop here for questions.
Finding the cause in general is very complicated. But in the supersymmetric case, you can sum half times range so that the quantum fluctuations cancel. And you reduce simply contributions of classical solutions. Weighted by determinants, which work with the supersymmetry, can come down to size. So you can have a perfectly good physical theorem where if you specialize to a very limited class of observables, the time interval collapses to account for the solutions. And then in the math world, people study the solutions just how they account. But in the physics world, I think there's a much, much bigger universe. And the count is just a specialization of the real picture. And these two ways of looking at things have gone on in parallel for decades. I hope that was fairly clear. The thing is, our sum for our sum of these applications. To explain the boundary condition of the closest zero, we have to describe some special solutions in three dimensions. One such solution for each irreducible representation of the real group. So that's, the, that's one reason you should look at the equations in three dimensions, which is that without understanding them, you can't get the boundary conditions. But there's another reason. Well, first of all, to compute the jump phenomenon, we have to introduce the four dimensions. Well, how are we supposed to describe four dimensional solutions? There's a standard strategy that's often used in this type of theory, where you stretch the knot in one dimension, <coughs> trying to reduce to a piecewise description in one dimension less. So here I've just taken the knot, but it does stretch it upwards. And the idea is that if I stretch it up and I fetch it, you replace the boundary by R3. We want to reduce to a situation where these solutions, although they're in four dimensions, are everywhere almost independent of time. So understanding the three-dimensional solutions would be the starting point to then putting back into time dependence to get the four-dimensional solutions. This is a standard technique in Donaldson and Floor theory that all those things. So um, therefore, it's crucial to understand three-dimensional solutions, even if your goal is solutions in four or five dimensions. There's another way to make the point, which is that, you see, in my lecture, there was no category theory. There's a good reason for it, which is that what I know about categories wouldn't be very simple. But in other lectures on category theory, in uh, cohomology, it would all be about categories. And you proceed directly or indirectly by defining a category of objects associated to a two sphere, or perhaps to R2, with mark points that are suitably labeled. So, in the present case, you should get this category by studying three dimensional solutions. So, where Kalonov defines a category associated to a two sphere with mark points, for me, we would solve the three dimensional equation on the two sphere amount of R plus. And then Kalonov's category would be an A model category associated with that space. So, there are a lot of reasons we have to study the equations in three dimensions. And I really think I shouldn't take the time to tell you all this. But just to give an overview, we showed that the equations in three dimensions have a really simple structure, especially when you also introduce the knot projection. Uh, I think I really... A lot of nice things happen. That's the best summary I can give. Thank you. Uh, final question?